All right, welcome everyone. Uh, Carrie with the Texas Mini Milkers and host of the Mini Dairy Goat podcast. We again have partnered with um, the Education Committee for the Texas Mini Milkers, and we are bringing you guys a really great educational webinar today. So I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Taub. She's our Education Chair for the Texas Mini Milkers, and she's going to introduce our guest speakers for today. Michelle? Hey, thanks, Carrie. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm really excited that um, Dr. Kashu um, agreed to do this because um, I've been using UBRL for uh, since we really started with goats. So uh, our main speaker is Dr. Kushu, and we are his guest speaker is um, um, his lab manager, Omar Sanchez. And I speak to Omar a lot on the phone. Um, and I'm really looking forward to learning how they do things and, of course, you know, more of why we should do these things. So, Dr. Kushu, it's all yours. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so, uh, I, I'm really happy to uh, talk about some of the things um, that you see on the screen, basically farm biosecurity, why herd health screening is important, what diseases we should think about, how pregnancy testing works as well, since we are here. Um, so the goal is to get some basic information out there uh, with the good community and uh, try to you know do some outreach. Um, I have Omar with me. Uh, uh, so we'll be going over slides and we'll be sharing the stage as we go and we will answer the questions at the end. So let's move to the first slide. Um, so here are the areas to be covered today. As I said, farm biosecurity, herd health testing, um, collection and shipping samples to the lab, what to do, what not to do. Uh, Omar will talk about that a little bit. Um, what are the steps in processing in the laboratory? So you can see the other side of the processing that happens here. Uh, what does lab safety and quality mean? And uh, then question and answers. Um, so just to uh, say this, that uh, of course we took some slides from the internet, some pictures and images, and we don't own them. Uh, this is just for the purpose of education and providing outreach. Um, if we have some references in there, but some are not labeled, if you need more information on the references, we can always provide those as well. Um, so starting from UBRL, so we were actually a human diagnostic lab when we started in 2014, and we added the livestock division in 2015. And uh, so this was more... Um, not by design, but you know, serendipitously happened. Uh, but our mission uh, with livestock is to serve and empower our producers and veterinarians to maximize individual animal health, but herd health as well, to achieve high productivity, public health safety, and sustainability. Our overall goal is to eradicate all these diseases from United States. Someday we'll reach there. Our core values are we want high quality outcomes for our clients. We want evidence-based diagnostics, timely work, cost-effective work, highly communicative work, and of course, client-centeredness is the most important thing for us. Um, so what does biosecurity mean? It refers to measures that we take uh, to prevent introduction or spread of, spread of harmful organisms. It could be bacteria, as you see on the left, viruses in the middle, and parasites or fungi and protozoans in the, on the right. Uh, so our goal is to um, minimize these risks of transmission of these infectious diseases. They do happen or they do appear on properties and in farms in various places and we want to minimize them and we see them. Um, in agriculture, these measures are aimed to protect food crops or livestock from pests, invasive species, other organisms, that are parasites and are not conducive for welfare of humans and the animals we have. So uh, if you think about biosecurity, uh, a lot of people have a maps and they already plan and a uh, have a biosecurity plan. So um, one of the things is to identify a livestock disease of concern. What are those? Because they can spread in the whole herd and create a bigger problem. So nip them in the bud. Well, prevent first, but if you do something, how to prevent it from spreading as well. So what are the various risks to your employees as well as visitors that come to your farm? How can they be a risk and how can you create a risk for them? 
for that we prepare maps we mark areas we make sure that you know we have biosecurity plans in place we have good farm management practices uh, of course we are not going into details with that these were just some of the steps we listed and have good protocols overall um, we have to keep in mind what are the inputs that come into the farm, what are the outputs we take from the farms, what are the ve people, vehicle equipment. Uh, typically, we call them fomites, um, things that can influence and cause uh, infections to spread uh, our practices for production and also how do we record things. The overall goal is to have a good cross-sectorial biosecurity plan so we can improve public health, we can improve agriculture, we can improve the environment and we can enhance our business or production as well. Um, so first things first, we'll talk about some of the diseases that we typically are concerned about, uh, especially with goat and sheep. And uh, we'll talk about five diseases as such very briefly. And if you want more information, we can provide details later on as well. So the first one we are going to talk about is CAE. I think most of the people have heard about this disease I would say this is the most common or prevalent disease as well. Um, the second one would be OPP, which is very similar to CAE. And the third one is uh, caseous lymphadenitis, fourth is yonis, and fifth is Q fever. Uh, I would say brucellosis is important too, and that kind of completes the panel, panel but we don't offer that test. So uh, we are not going to talk about that, but if you need more information, we can always provide that too. So let's start with CAE. Uh, so you can see that virus on the right, that's basically the CAE virus. It's a lentivirus or a, it's a retrovirus, which basically means it's a single standard RNA virus. Um, so this is a group of virus, actually a family called small ruminant lentivirus, SRLV, and CAE and OPP are part of the same family. Um, so we test for this virus in goats um, and they can also infect sheep and likewise OPP can affect sheep and goats too. Um, so the typical symptoms that you see, that's clinical signs on the right, you can see a goat with an arthritic joint or arthritis or polyarthritis. Um, with young kids, it can cause encephalitis where you'll have a lot more head movement and shaking. Um, with older animals, you'll see more arthritic uh, outcomes. Um, most animals show no clinical signs of the disease, but can be persistent carriers. That's why you have to test and screen. Um, and the biggest mode of transmission for CAE is vertical. That means through milk or colostrum from mom to babies. But there are ways it can spread horizontally. That is from one animal to another animal. That's not related, but in the same vicinity. Uh, respiratory, uh, respiratory secretions can harbor infectious viruses and can lead to infections. So we do need good management practices and reliable diagnostic tools to make sure that A, we prevent, B, we, do, we control the spread of disease. So that was CAE and OPPV. Um, the second one uh, is caseous lymphadenitis or CL, commonly known as CL. Uh, now, this is caused by coronary bacterium pseudotuberculosis. That's a bacterium. Um, and you can see on the right, you'll see uh, various locations that are listed in red dots on that goat. Uh, but you will see on the second picture, you can see actually a CL abscess that's ripe and ready to burst open um, on the goat. Um, so it is characterized by abscess formation in a near or major peripheral lymph nodes if it's external, or it can be internal as well. It can be in the internal organs, it can be in the lungs, it can be in the viscera, it can be in the liver. Um, so external form, forms are more common in goats, internal forms are more common in sheep. Um, it's not a curable disease. Um, it does lead, lead to economic losses, including death, condemnation. So your carcass can be rejected if it's spread or it's kind of spread in the, inside the body. Um, it can um, reduce the or quality of hide or the wool, um, loss of sales of breeding animals, and you may have to cull some animals if you want to get rid of this problem. Um, so you don't want this problem to the first, in the first place. It has zoonotic potential, so it can infect humans as well. Um, so that's why whenever you are handling any animal that has a CL abscess, make sure that you are gloved up and you have all PPE to protect yourself. 
and um, this bacterium can also survive in the environment for a long time. So we would not want to have environmental contamination. So you don't want any abscesses to burst open into organic matter, basically. And, and if you have questions, we can talk about that too. Um, because it's, it's harder to get rid of this problem if it gets into the environment. Um, at the bottom, you can see a lung abscess showing a typical yellow green pink pus. So that's an internal abscess. Um, as I said, it can be internal or external. And the herd should be routinely tested and we have a test for that. Um, and the animal may not show obvious or clinical symptoms for a while. So it can stay latent for a while, even after the animal got exposed. So that's why routine and uh, annual testing is important. Um, so next disease I'm going to talk about is yonis. Um, this is caused by mycobacterium paratuberculosis. You can see the picture of the bacterium on the right. Um, it's a slow, progressive, contagious, and untreatable disease. It infects cattle, goat, and sheep. Um, so if you have cattle, there is a possibility of cross um, species con uh, you know, exposure. Um, so um, it does lead to weight loss and diarrhea, which is more pronounced in cattle. With goats, they can look healthy, but they still may be carrying the pathogen for a long time. Um, and then um, eventually they do show the signs as you can see in the picture. And the incubation period can be from months to a few years. Um, animals can become really weak in the later stage of infection, but they, for goats especially, they may not show that early on. Um, again, this bacterium spreads in the environment through feces um, for the most part. And then again, and this bacterium can survive in the organic matter for a long time like CL. So we don't want environmental contamination of yonis in your property. Um, it can be introduced a, in a new goat, cow, sheep, and other through manure, as I said, that's the most common way it spreads. Um, and uh, death may occur in some infected animals or at some stage in point, but you may, your animals may look healthy and plump and they may look all right, but they can have yonis, uh, especially in the initial stages, it won't even show. So testing is important and knowing, um, doing your herd screenings are important for yonis as well. So the first disease I want to talk about is Q fever. Um, there's a small image of bacterium. The more important thing about Q fever is, well, it's caused by Coxiella burnetti, but, uh, and it infects many animals, but we are here focused on livestock. So we'll say goat, sheep, and cattle are um, the pathogen hosts for this pathogen. Um, it is found in birth products. So placenta, amniotic fluids, urine, feces, milk of infected animals can all carry this pathogen if the animal was infected. Um, people can get infection by breathing in just dust because this bacterium can aerosolize. So this can get into the environment by air, not just you know water or um, soil. Um, and that's where it becomes a little more, um, it's not only more infectious, it's also more risky in that sense because it can spread through air. Um, so, I have some data here showing um, incidents in humans because we have had some of our clients and unfortunately that have got exposed to Q fever or they have had some chronic Q fever issues. So just in the interest of people, I wanted to share. And I think people know least about Q fever um, in these diseases. So this is the data. You can see the map of United States that's incidence of um, Q fever per million population reported in the US. Um, so important thing is 36% of human cases that have been reported are in from three states, California, Texas, and Iowa. So um, we are where we are and where you guys are, uh, we are you know high incidence places. So to be extra careful for that. Um, and uh, more cases of Q fever are reported in older people, especially men. That's probably an occupational hazard too, because um, Q fever also spreads through cattle and all that. So, and a lot of, you know, men work in big um, cattle groups or industries. Um, 
So if you are a person with uh, having endocarditis or heart issues or health issues, weakened immune system or pregnant, you have a higher risk of infection and severe disease from Q fever. So something to be really careful about um, for people who work with livestock. Um, so um, the other test that we do is a pregnancy test. We, have, we are a bioprint affiliate lab for that. Um, so one of the requirements for that is your goat or sheep should be 30 days post breeding when you are testing for accuracy. Um, if they are under 30 days, it may not be as accurate because we may miss some pregnancies. Uh, usually if it's close to 20 days or lower then for sure there's a higher chance as it gets closer to 30 days, um, the accuracy improves. 30 days or more is the most accurate test. So what we test in pregnancy is a pregnancy associated glycoprotein. It's called pregnancy specific protein B. It is secreted by the trophoblast cells of the placenta. So as uh, the pregnancy matures and this uh, protein secretion happens and it accumulates over time and that's what we are measuring. And the test does not really tell you anything about gestation or you know how far along the animal is, but it is a yes or no kind of a test. And if you have questions, we can talk about that. Um, your cattle, goat, and sheep can be tested for pregnancy using this test in the lab. Um, this is a schematic for the, how the test works. So it's basically a little more technical, but very simply say, um, so you have a plate where you um, have an antigen. Antigen will be a part of a molecule that is part of the pathogen. That means part of the bacterium or the virus that you are trying to look for and investigate. So we coat a plate with that protein uh, usually, um, and then we throw antibodies from your blood sample onto that protein and try to see what clings onto that protein. If you do have antibodies against that pathogen or that bacteria or that virus, then the antibody will get stuck there and we can develop that reaction and see in what cases or in which cases did the antibody get stuck? And that kind of tells you, okay, oh, there was a detection of uh, antibody in the blood sample. You can also have the reverse thing where you're detecting antigens. Antigens means part of the virus or part of the bacterium and antibody means anything that has reacted to it and is in the blood. It's a multi-step process and it kind of gives you coloration as you can see. And what we do is we measure that color in an instrument called spectrophotometer. And then that gives us variation in readings and helps us interpret the results and give you a you know, diagnosis or status of your animal. So that's kind of about the disease and about testing. Now Omar will talk about the next session. So I'm basically gonna go over kind of the processes of what we do here in the lab and uh, what to expect whenever you're sending samples over here. Um, so first things first, even on our website, we have a picture by picture kind of diagram guideline that kind of shows you how to collect the, sam the sample and ship it to us. So typically uh, the most important thing is that you collect it on a red top tube or you, there's other also serum separator tubes or tiger top tubes. But the most important part is that it's the red top tubes. Um, every once in a while we get lavender tubes and there's only a select uh, test that we can run on those. And there are some that we can't. So we had to reject testing for some of those. So just make sure that you're collecting the right red top tube. And if you have any questions about that, whenever you're sending to us, you can always just send the photo, uh, take a photo of the tube and just email it to us. And we'll let you know if it's good or not. Uh, but basically you're gonna wanna collect, collect at least one ml of uh, serum or one ml of blood. Once you collect it, uh, try to ship it within a day or two from when you collect it. If you're not going to ship it right away, um, just throw it in the refrigerator, but just make sure that it's important that you don't freeze it. Um, just keep it in the refrigerator. Just keep it cold in there. Uh, once it's ready to ship, you're going to want to bundle everything in uh, no more than 10 uh, tubes per bundle. You're going to wrap everything in paper towels, newspaper, or anything like that. Basically, just enough paper towels to kind of absorb the blood if anything leaks or breaks during transit. You're going to then place that in a Ziploc bag uh, for the exact same reason. Um, just in case anything leaks or breaks, you don't want it uh, spreading outside of the box. Um, depending what test you're doing, if you're only going to do the pregnancy testing for goat, sheep, or cattle with us, um, you do not need an ice pack in there. It's not required. 
Um, if it's scorching hot outside and you want to throw one in there, you can throw a small one in there. Um, but generally, those are good. Um, if you're going to do any of our disease testing, like Yonas, CLC, and Q fever, um, then you're definitely going to want to throw at least one small ice pack in there. Um, you don't need a styrofoam cooler or anything like that if you're not going to send a lot of samples, but basically you're just going to have your samples in a Ziploc bag with the paper towels, your ice pack in its own Ziploc bag because of the condensation from the ice pack. And then you're going to fill out a form um, that you can also get from our website that will have your contact info on there and um, the names of the animals, what tests you want and everything on there. You'll stick it in a small cardboard box. Um, every once in a while, people will send them in padded envelopes. And we usually don't recommend doing that unless you throw it in a box first. Um, we've gotten uh, a lot of tubes that have been broken during transit because they've been put it just in padded envelopes and that's it. And we all know how shipping carriers uh, treat all that. Um, so usually we also recommend using UPS or FedEx. Um, FedEx ground or UPS ground is perfectly acceptable. Three to five days shipping is kind of what we ideally want. And then seven days in transit is the max. Um, post office is what we get the most of, but just be aware, um, we also get the most issues with post office, um, just depending where you're at. I know you guys are in Texas, so just uh, if the weather is not doing so well, post office doesn't tend to do so well. Or if we're near a holiday, post office doesn't do well. Sometimes it'll take 13, 14 days to get here. Um, and I generally don't have that issue with UPS or FedEx. The most I get is like a day delay. Um, the other thing too that I forgot to mention, when you do collect your sample, the most important thing too is to make sure you label everything correctly as you're collecting. Um, so you're gonna wanna have your animal ID on there. Um, and that would just be whatever you call the animal. Um, and then you'll have a tube number. Uh, the tube number you're gonna get from the submission form so let's say you have five samples. It's just going to be one, two, three, four, five on the tubes, um, just so we can put everything in the same order. Um, and then uh, on the outside of the box, you're going to make sure that you write exempt animal specimen. Every once in a while, I have some clients that call and say that UPS or post office is not, not wanting to accept the package. Um, so just make sure you let them know that it's an exempt animal specimen package. Um, it's considered a category B. And you can even Google it and pull up the post office website or UPS website and just show them right there that they should be able to accept it. You're not doing anything wrong. This is how it's done in every single lab. It's just sometimes they have new employees or they're just not used to getting blood samples. Um, so they, they'll rather say no than accept it. Um, and then the last thing you would want to do is once you do ship it off, if you can just email us saying, hey, I sent uh, this many samples for these tests and give us a tracking number that lets us know to keep an eye out for your package and just so we can kind of have an idea of our volume for the week. Um, some other important things too is make sure you do not use dry ice. Those will freeze your samples and uh, it, it makes it more difficult for testing for that. So just make sure you only throw a nice pack in there. Um, and then I'm gonna go to the next one. So we do have uh, collection kits available on our website. Um, you definitely don't need to get them from us. Uh, the most important thing is that you get red top tubes um, as you're seeing right there on the slide. Um, so we do have uh, the double-sided needle option and syringe option. Usually we recommend using syringes if you're kind of new to collecting samples. A lot of people have more difficulty with the double-sided needles um, and syringes is a little bit easier if you're kind of new to it. Uh, but it is on our website. And like I mentioned before, if you want to get them anywhere else, and you're not sure if you're getting the right ones, just take a photo, a screenshot, and just email us, and we'll let you know if it's good or not uh, for us to use. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and play a video right now, and if you can't hear or anything like that, please let us know. Hi, my name is Omar, and I'm the lab tech slash manager of the lab. This video is going to show you how we process samples in the lab. Most of the samples come in the mail, but we do get some that are dropped off in person. Most of the samples are sent as whole blood or in serum separator tubes where the serum is separated. Both are acceptable, um, but if they do come in in whole blood, as seen here, 
we have to put them inside a centrifuge uh, so that way we can separate out the serum. As you can see here, the one on the left is how it looked like before when it was whole blood, and the one on the right is after with the serum separated. It looks a lot clearer. Once we're done recording all the submissions that come in and we put everything on a plate grid, and you can kind of see it there on the paper, um, everything is labeled by animals so we know the placement, uh, where, where to put it on the 96 well plate. So each one of those little circles on there is one sample. We also have to put in controls in each spot Having this play grid ensures that we're putting the correct sample in the correct spot and there's no misidentification issues when we're reporting. After we're done loading the samples, we have to allow some time to incubate in the plate and there's going to be different steps uh, with different reagents along the process. So there's a washing step and adding TMB, stop and other different things that my director will probably go over with you. At this step in the protocol, we are washing the plate a couple of times. Uh, for different uh, tests, we do different amounts of washes. It all just kind of depends. At this step, we have already added the TMB and let it sit for a while. As you can tell, the really, really dark blue spots right there that are circled, those are where the positive controls are. We're not done yet. We still have to stop the reaction to make sure it doesn't continue developing. Once we stop it, then we'll be adding it to a spectrophotometer, which you'll see here soon. That spectrophotometer will give us the exact reading This machine right here is a spectrophotometer I mentioned a little while ago. So a spectrophotometer measures light intensity as a function of wavelength. In basic terms, it just uh, the stronger the color in the well, the higher the concentration will be, and the more clear it is, the lower the concentration will be. Uh, the higher the concentration, just depending on what test it is, it'll tell us whether something's positive or negative. So right here, you'll see the exact numbers. The red circles here indicate where the positive controls were. Um, in this case, uh, for Jonas, everything was negative. There is a little bit of color on some of them, but after we calculate um, using our software, it still came back negative. Once we run all those calculations, we plug everything else into reports and it's all ready to go. In this case, this is just a sample, it's not an actual client. Um, everything came back negative for Jonas. Samples are normally emailed, but sometimes people want by fax or they want us to just call with results. This completes our sample process video. Thank you for listening. All right, so after that, let's see. Hi, my So um, here are uh, some examples of things. I think more you should add. Um, so right here on the left, we have the submission form that I was speaking about before that you can get on our website. So this is a requirement. Whenever you send any samples to the lab, you definitely should fill out one of these. Um, basically, it's just a generic information. So just the contact info, how you want the report sent to you, what type of animal it is, if it's goat, sheep, cattle, um, and then how many samples you sent, the names of the animals. Um, on there, we write animal ID, um, and then what tests you want for each one. And as I mentioned before, right to the left, that tube number right next to the animal IDs, that's the number that you're going to put on the tube itself. Um, so whenever you're sending 10, 20 samples at a time, it's very important to have those tube numbers written on the tubes as well. Um, it helps us put everything in the same order as your submission form. It's also a second identifier because we do get a lot of samples. The chances of another Bob goat or Billy goat um, from another account is very common. So having a billy goat named one on one tube and billy goat number four on another kind of helps us as well. Um, and then we also have our pricing and schedule that you can also find on our website. 
It'll basically let you know whenever we run our tests, uh, which the most common ones are the biosecurity screen, which includes CL, CA, and Jonas. Those are usually started Thursday noon. We usually tell people to try to get those samples in by either Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday morning if they want results by Friday, because we only run those once a week generally. Um, there's other tests on there that you can look over, um, but everything's on there. Um, you can look at what tests we offer even for cattle. We also have some for equine that we didn't mention. Um, so you can go on there. Um, and then there's also the pregnancy testing as well on there. The We don't charge a setup fee for pregnancy, even if you send one sample. Um, so it's just $6 even. Um, sometimes people will have questions on how the setup fee works. And it's basically, if you have, if any disease test um, has four samples or less, then we'll charge a $10 setup fee. Um, but we only charge one $10 setup fee max for submission form. So for instance, if you send two samples for CL, two samples for CAE, and two samples for Jonas, that's just gonna be a one $10 setup fee, not three setup fees. Um, and then vice versa, if you send 10 CAE, but you still send one CL, we're still gonna, we're still gonna charge a setup fee because CL was under five samples. Um, and if you ever have questions beforehand as well um, about pricing, we can give us a call, email us. Sometimes we'll respond to some emails after hours and we'll let you know the final price. Um, generally, people like to send a check, but there's also the option of just sending the samples as is. Once we get the samples here in the lab, we can invoice you by email and you just pay online with any PayPal, debit or credit card or anything like that as well. As long as you pay before we're scheduled to report, there shouldn't be any issues there. All right, so uh, the other thing we need to think about when we work in a lab is lab safety. So um, so lab has to have a risk management protocol just like you have farm management protocols. So, um, so point is to identify any issues, analyze, create action plans to improve on issues or figure out any problems, monitor your activities in the lab and control for that. Um, the lab does have a lot of risk issues. For example, there are sharps, um, there are heat hazards, there are glass wares, there are electric hazards, there are eye wash, eye, because you can squirt solutions into your eyes. That's why you have protective uh, coverings and coat, lab coats, gloves, eye protection, but you need to have um, stations where you can wash your eyes. In case there is a fire, you have to have fire extinguishers everywhere as per code. Uh, you have to think about biohazards. Um, blood samples are considered biohazards uh, at certain levels. So you have to make sure that you, know, you have the right PPE to protect yourself. We don't have radioactive work here and laser radiation. So those don't work, but everything else is very significant and we have to plan for all that and have a lab. So if you think in terms of our labs, um, UBRL is a BSL-2 kind of facility, which is a biosafety level two. So we have so many things in place, the protocols, the directions, the trainings, the education for our staff to make sure that not only we provide good quality work, we also provide safe work. Um, so bringing to quality, uh, so every lab, uh, what you see are results. So it's like an iceberg, top of your iceberg. And all you receive is a report that kind of tells you what you got. But in order to generate that report, there are multiple things that happen in the background. And usually they are on the bottom or under the water in the iceberg uh, scenario. So you have to monitor the quality of a specimen. You have to co have quality controls. You have to have calibrations. You have to have a methodology to troubleshoot errors and look at abnormal results. So you have to have methodologies to do um, competencies of your um, you know, lab members and proficiency testing is another important aspect that we do. Um, maintenance of instruments, calibration of instruments, monitoring of temperature. So we have six, seven different refrigerators and minus 20 freezers that we have to monitor um, minute by minute just to make sure you know nothing happens and our things don't get compromised, including samples and the testing kits. We have to have a strategy for monitoring inventory and make sure you know nothing is expired and we don't run out of things. So there are a lot of stuff. So how do we do that? Uh, well, we do a lot of education and training for our employees. Um, and that's part of you know biosecurity training, just like you have farm management plans, we have 
lab plans and uh, we do you know bloodborne pathogen training things like that and how to stay safe how to not cut yourself how to um, not um, get blood on your um, even clothes or things like that uh, we do assay validation so all these tests that you see have been validated using control samples or quality samples and make sure that these tests actually do what they say so when the manufacturer sends a kit out they have um, a USDA approved kit, or it could just be a research kit. But in a lab, we have to first identify and make sure that what they claim is actually what is happening because we are responsible for results to our clients. And we want to make sure whatever we out from the lab is actually reliable and supportive. Part of that is also doing proficiency testing. So you can see we are approved for Yoni's disease from USDA. And similarly, we are also approved for Coggins test for equine. Um, these have been done to show that we are a standardized lab and we can do all these good things. So what we what happens is we do get blinded samples from USDA or APHIS uh, for unis, and we have to report blinded samples like we report actual samples. And they evaluate us on our results and they then justify okay okay you are a reasonable you know lab doing right procedures so so we have those blinded samples that we have to test for every every year for all the tests that some of the tests we do um, we have accreditation so usda did give us accreditation based on that too so proficiency is one aspect of that uh, we have quality assurance and quality control so all the mechanisms that we have in place during testing to make sure that you know we are a reliable lab, we are a quality lab. We have to calibrate and monitor all our instruments, including refrigerators and any other instrument that we use. Um, we believe in qual continuous quality improvement. So every time we sit down, we have a meeting, we talk about how can we improve this process better? How can we make it better for our clients? And we have had so much client feedback and we are so grateful because that has helped us be here today in the last eight, nine years of development. Uh, we do attend conferences and events, we do outreach. So we annually go to UC Davis for the good day. We sponsor the event as well, but we attend the event as well just to learn new things. What is happening? Where are we improving? What is happening in the testing world? What is happening in the infection world? Um, how are things moving, progressing? And of course, the most important part is customer feedback. We love our customers' feedback because that's the only way to improve. And um, we have been grateful to have customers who have given us inputs and helped us achieve better results. In all, I mean, biosecurity and the health of our animals in our hands, in our, I mean, producers, veterinarians, and the laboratory personnel. And if we work together, we can really um, eradicate these diseases from the United States and have a healthy herd and public health. Um, this is some of the community events we do. Uh, we provide gift certificates and vouchers for goat shows. Uh, we, are, we sponsor, as I said, Goat Day. Every year we go there. And um, we are also member of ADGA, but if there are other organizations, we can also look into membership there. Um, this is kind of where we are in terms of our clients. So we have clients all over US, including Puerto Rico, Hawaii, Alaska, and we have clients in Canada. This is kind of a heat map. So you can see we have clients all over US and we are almost uh, reaching 6,000 clients now um, in the United States and Canada. So we are really happy with that and we really feel blessed to have clients and uh, we would like to have more clients and provide more services to more people so that we can eradicate these diseases and become a productive livestock country. So this is our last slide. You already know Omar. We have um, Chantel, Chantel and Zelali. And then if some of you guys have used this before, Jonathan was working here for a good amount of years, but he since then moved on. Um, but this is our team. Yeah, and thank you for giving us a chance to talk to you and show you some stuff. And hopefully it was informational. And as I said, if, if you need more information, you can always reach us and we are here to um, provide whatever we can. Thank you. Let's see. Okay.
Okay, so if you guys have any questions, if you want to type them in the chat, um, I can uh, relay them so that we just keep it um, kind of fluid. I do have a question um, about the Q fever. Um, I have my females tested, but I don't, um, I haven't, I don't think I've tested my males. Should the males be tested also? Yes, all animals should be tested because it's a bacterium. It's not going to identify whether somebody is a male or a female. The only thing that you would have to think about is how it spreads. So females are more important because let's say you have a female that has an active infection and then she is ready to kid. That's where you could have a serious problem in the sense that your birthing fluids, your placenta um, are rich in this virus. So what happens is at the time of birthing, you may, if, if there is an inf active infection, you may have like a nuclear explosion where this will aerosolize and get into the environment. It can spread up to two miles even like the bacterium. And so, oh. so this, this can create exposure to the human beings that are handling animals, but also to surrounding areas or, you know, other animals in the farm. Um, so that's why we focus a lot on females because we want to make sure there's no active infection going on, especially during or close to kidding or, you know, in animals. But of course, they should always be negative. But any animal can get infected, right? It's a bacterium. It's not going to um, look at an animal and say, hey, this is not that important. Yeah. Um, and then um, how often should we test for Q fever? Should we do that annually every year? Because some farms do like biosecurity and they do it for like three years and then they skip a year and start doing it every other year. Once they've established, like if they have a closed herd, they're mm -hmm. not bringing any new animals in. So they'll do two or three years of testing and then skip a year. So uh, I think I think it all depends on what a producer wants. I never tell them like, how, what to do, but generally speaking, if you go by common sense, of course, if you are a new operation and you don't know the animals, these are new, newly bought animals or newly started operation, I would say test at the time of purchase, but know the history of people you're buying from because some things can stay latent and you may still get a negative result, but doesn't mean that the animal did not get exposed. So having that understanding with the you know, but between the buyer and the seller, knowing where you're getting your stock from is very important. But then testing your animal once you receive them, quarantine them, test them. If you get a negative, I think it's a better place to start. But if you, if these are totally new animals and if you are totally new to testing, I would say in the first year, test at time zero, maybe in six months, maybe in a year. So you have three data points in one year and you know everything is negative in that period. And then you can choose to go to an annual testing. But let's say you have been testing for a while and you have annual testing done for let's say a few years and you have a closed herd. I mean, closed herd technically sounds easy, but maintaining biosecurity is very hard in terms of breaches can happen because of the fomites, if nothing else. Maybe you didn't bring any new animals, but maybe you people came, they carried something or you used an instrument that came from somewhere else and it had something so, and things have happened. Like uh, I talk to people and a lot of time they say, oh, but nothing has happened and this and that. And, you know, but then they realize, oh, but this happened. Oh, I went to my friend's farm and, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So there are ways that infection is not only spread by the animals itself, but it can come through various non-living things that we don't think about, including our shoes, including yeah. our clothing. Um, so, which is which are fomites? Which yeah, are fomites? fomites so, right, right. Yeah. So I don't know if that was mentioned, but a fomite is anything that is a non. It can be a non-living surface that bacteria has a time that they can live on it, and you can spread it to others. A doorknob is a fomite. So. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I teach high school. I'm always trying to get kids to clean up where they touch things because I'm like, it's a fomite. Anything you have on you, you've now put on the table. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so, um, so back to the testing. I'm sorry, I digress. Um, how, how often can there be false positives? I mean, what, what is that ratio? How does that happen? 
like for people getting false positives? Okay, so multiple things. This is like a Pandora box <laughs> because I talk about this a lot. So <laughs> it, it, it depends on so many factors. So every test is different. If you think about it, every animal is different. Every collection is different. Every tester is different. Every kit is different. Every patch is different. So there are lots of variables in this game. And uh, so I'll give you by example. So if you are doing CAE, you have different risk factors to get a false positive versus if you're doing CL versus if you're doing UNIS versus you're doing Q fever. So there is no standardized way of answering this question in terms of, you know, why do you get false positive? You can get, so CL is notoriously more famous for getting false positive. Um, CAE used to be but it has gone better in the last five years because we do all these internal testing and we work with the actual manufacturer and tell, give them feedback also. When we do testing, we say, hey, we are getting some flags and this and that. So that's what how we work with a VMRD, which makes the CAE kit uh, that's licensed in US. And um, so I think four or five years ago, they fixed their issue. So we gave them a lot of feedback and then, but I think once they fix that, it is a very reliable kit. So I would say there are fewer chances to get a false positive on CAE test nowadays. Um, but if your animal is young, under six months of age, you can get a false positive to influence or maternal antibodies in the animal, right? Because when they are born, they have passive immunity. They're only getting immunity from the moms and the colostrum they are getting, right? So there is a overload of circulating antibodies. And if you trust a young animal, there's a chance you'll get. Doesn't mean that you will definitely get, but there's a chance some animals may test false positive. Um, I, we have not, we don't have data to show that, but, um, we have heard and we have read that, let's say if you do CDT vaccination and you take a sample very close to vaccination, technically that can give you a false flag. And the logic does make sense because then you are priming the immune system to create antibodies against, um, right. As whatever you're injecting. So, um, and then that can interfere in the assay. Uh, we don't have data to show that, you know, you, whether, so we typically say, if you are doing CDT, wait three weeks before you test, rather than just collect a sample right away or test before you give CDT. So that- That, yeah, that actually through. happened to me. Yeah. <laughs> that so, actually so. happened to me, yeah. So um, we do have another question. We have, uh, Amber wants to know if she can send in goats, cattle, and uh, equine all at the same time. Can she put them all on one test form or is it too different? Well, so cattle, goat, and sheep are on one test form and we have a separate uh, submission form for equine. Um, they're all on the website, but they, can't... but they can be sent in the same box and then there's no issues with that. We actually, um, we even recommend if you have neighbors or if you have other friends that are going to send around the same time as you, you can send in the same box. You can still have your own separate submission form and separate group and we send reports separately and everything, and it'll save you some money on shipping as well. And we have several clients that like to do that. Did it. Yeah. <laughs> I've done that before also. And, and that, helps okay. with, uh, that helps with one more thing, which is basically set a fee. Yeah. So what happens is if you are five people sending samples in the same box, of course, writing, filling your own forms, because the report will be of the form. So whatever form you fill, you'll get a report corresponding to that form. So if you have the same box, but you have five different forms in there, and of course you package your sample separately, and collectively you have more than five samples for disease testing, the, sh the set of fee gets waived for everybody. Yeah. So if somebody had 10 samples, but somebody had only one sample, not only they save on shipping, they also save on set of fee, yeah. because now it's for the whole order, and whole order is the whole box. Yeah. And also the reverse of that, oh. if, if, you if you have, collectively you have less than five samples and we'll split the set of fee amongst however many submission forms there was. So if there was three submission forms, yeah. we'll put it three ways. That's so, awesome. Um, Carrie, Carrie wants to, know, I'm sorry. No, no. And I said it saves you shipping as well, yeah. you know, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, we all want to save money. <laughs> Carrie asked, um, are there published sensitivity and specificity specificity ranges for these tests for some yes actually for most um a cl no because it's a research use test 
um, it actually is not even manufactured in the United States. We had to import this kit, so it becomes very expensive to get CL thing done. But um, what we have is experience, and what we can tell you is it's a highly sensitive test, but I don't have numbers to, because we need to do a study. And one of the problems with doing a study is your positives need to be clinically validated. And we don't have the animals in the lab, right? We are not running an animal facility. So for us to do a, like a high quality study um, is harder. For CAE, yes, uh, it's highly sensitive, highly specific. So we feel pretty good about it. Um, anytime you get results in CAE and your results are above 60% inhibition, um, we have not seen animals come back from that number. So at 60% or more, uh, in most cases, like I would say 99.99% of cases, it's positive. Uh, if it's a lower positive, we also, that's why we also call and talk and make sure that people understand that. With, with Yonis, there is some sensitivity and specificity data uh, for the kit we use. Um, it was primarily developed on cattle samples, so it may not be super accurate for goats and sheep, but doesn't mean that test is super, like test is not accurate. One of the challenges with yonis is the pathogen itself. It's a very sneaky organism. And so even if you, and there are actually four different kits that do exist um, and that you can use. We use the one from IDEX. IDEX is a very reliable company. It's a world leader in livestock agnostics, you know, and we have used multiple kits from IDEX and we believe that, you know, they're very, very reliable. The other one is VMRD. They are also reliable. We have nothing against that too. So we use an IDEX kit for Yonis. We use VMRD kit for CAE. Um, for CL, as I said, it's not even manufactured in US. We had to import it. Um, but um, we don't have sensitivity specificity data, but it's a highly sensitive test. It's a less specific test. Um, and uh, uh, I didn't talk about CL while you were talking about false positives. So let's go back to that. So in CL, in case of CL, you can have more false positives. Um, and uh, that's our, from our experience. And there are multiple reasons uh, for that. Um, chronic stress, uh, compromised immune system. If your animal has some kind of cancers, especially sarcomas, uh, epileptic animals um, have shown false positive, false flags. Um, if, you, if your animal has, um, you know, as I said, immunocompromised or immune system in fighting infections. So if the animal had bronchitis and pneumonia recently in the last two months or one month, you might get a false flag on CL. So CL tends to have more false flags compared to CAE. Um, Yonis um, has values. So Yonis has its own challenges. I think it's more about the pathogen itself. Creating a great test is has not been super easy for Yonis um, because of its sneaky behavior. Um, and some of these, one of the challenges that you can see with Yonis and CAE, CL especially is that the, the infections, uh, even after exposure can stay latent for a while. So they won't turn clinical right away or they won't start, even in blood tests, they may not start showing zero positivity right away. So while as with CA, so, it can be faster. So with a Yoni's test, if it comes back positive, um, I had a farm contact me and ask me, they had two goats come back positive for Yoni's. And I told them, reach out to a university that does the fecal testing, mm -hmm. because that's how you would find out like definitively if your goat has Yoni's, because sometimes you can get false positives. Was I correct in telling her to have a fecal done. Yes, so uh, with Yonis, um, so serology is what we test in blood. So if you do serology testing, if your results are super strong, so this is what we are talking about is our lab only. We are not talking about generalized things, right? So different labs work differently. They have different levels of uh, doing work accurately. Um, we have a lot of things in place that we take pride in and uh, we, um, accurate, we are pretty accurate in terms of what we report. So all labs are different. Um, so we don't want to generalize, but generally speaking with Yonis, if you have a strong positive, so the values are above one in the test we do, 
we feel that uh, that's more or less a given. Um, you can always confirm with a fecal. It doesn't hurt. A fecal is a PCR test, so it's looking for antigen, while as our test is looking for antibodies. So our test is a little more indirect. That test is a little more direct, uh, looking for active pathogen, right? So it, it complements it well. Um, so yeah, um, there's no harm in doing a second opinion or a different kind of test to uh, you know, confirm uh, your diagnosis. Okay. Uh, Carrie wants to know if there's a minimum age at which you should start testing or does it depend on the test? It's about like minimum is eight months, right? We typically say six months and above. Um, and uh, so, so again, some common sense is needed in the sense that, uh, see, um, where are you getting your animal from? If it was born on your property, you have been negative, you are biosecure, you are a closed hood. If it's a young animal and we know mom is negative and the other herd mates are negative, you can wait eight months, you can wait nine months because you know your animal. If you are buying an animal from somebody, do you know that person well? Are you buying it from a sale barn? Are you buying it from a proper breeder with authentic you know, credentials? So all those things go into play. But if you don't know the animal or if you are not, if you don't, if you're not sure about the reliability, I would say, uh, get that animal test, like quarantine them test. At the most, you'll get a false flag if it's a very young animal, right? Let's say four months, five months old. Or if you can have a deal with the seller, ask them, hey, can we test the mom or can we test the herd mates? Uh, because then that's the best closest. So that's why um, a lot of people tend to do this. And um, I don't advise, but I see the financial aspect of it. So I am okay with it is that they either selectively test a few animals or very few animals, not a substantial portion of animals. So, you know, and then you can say, you can't test five animals and say hundred are negative. So you have to have a substantial pool of animals that you test regularly or periodically, or, you know, even if you are sampling, I don't expect you to test all the animals, but at least test your adult animals in a systematic way where you can actually, while saving money, still be biosecure. Don't just test one animal. I, I tend to, yeah, I split my my herd in half and do half in the fall and half in the spring is generally what I do. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, I understand that aspect. I'm, I mean, monies get tight or, you know, you have to have cash flows and all that. So I totally understand that, but have a system with that uh, to go with that, like, you know, so that in the end, your whole is kind of tested instead of, you know, assuming that, oh, based on these five animals, we are all good. We don't have to do anything else ever. Um, so there are some people with that mentality. So understanding that it's not a one-time thing and done. Um, it's something you have to be vigilant about. You have to be thinking about and not just testing part, the whole biosecurity part of it, like you know, to keep everything safe, including yourself. Okay. Yes. <laughs> well, if no one else has any more questions, I'm going to turn it over to our president, Carrie, so she can wrap it up. And I, I, I really want to thank you both for doing this. I love your lab. I send mo many people to go to UBRL, go to UBRL. I love your customer service, and um, I know that if I don't let Omar know that I re that I got my results, he'll be calling me on Saturday. Thank you. And he's the one calling <laughs> on the weekends because we confused every single one of our clients. Okay. <laughs> I, if you talk to me during the weekday, that's me, and he's on the weekend. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Michelle. We did have another comment from Wendy. She said, thank you so much. I will say your rapid turnaround and timely responses to emails are top notch. So another shout out. Uh, from thank you. Answer. So, wow. I mean, what a great presentation, guys. Really enjoyed this. Um, thank you to all of our Texas Mini Milker members that joined. Um, this will be rebroadcast on the Mini Dairy Goat podcast. And I'll try to actually um, also post it to the YouTube channel as well. Um, since we did record uh, the audio and the video. So with that, I'm going to stop recording.